Welcome to the next installment of In the Shadow of the Titan. Today, I've donned my most queenly child of the forest uh, wig and attitude in order to bring you an episode that is mainly focused on comparisons between Bravos, Green Seer, and Children of the Forest magic. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> I set out to map and compare all of the Green Seer related imagery and symbolism in Bravos, alongside the magical artifacts that we find in the Faceless Men's House of Black and White. Alas, as so often happens when analyzing George R. Martin's rich work, I bit off more than I could chew in a single essay, so I have split this analysis into two distinct but related sections. This part compares the city of Bravos to other locations like Greywater Watch and Blood Raven's Cave, that the story heavily associates with green seer magic. I propose that George has left us a green print, a series of terrain features and other physical clues that indicate either green seer magic or a dwelling of the children of the forest. I call this the wet wild, and the concept, which I will outline later in the essay, is based on Jojen Reed's description of Greywater Watch. We start here with the more abstract analysis, because laying the green paint groundwork in Bravos is important to understanding how George R. R. Martin uses nature imagery to hint at magic. In the next part of the series, we will look at the magical artifacts inside the House of Black and White. That analysis will have a much better context if we already understand what's happening above the water in Bravos. The Wet Wild Remembers, Exploring the Spectrum of Weirwood Magic. Before we dive deep into the Green Sea, I want to clarify a couple terms and interlocking systems of symbolism. If this sounds super boring, let me clarify that I'm talking about symbols and stories related to the nature cycle and underworld mythology, which are not only freaking awesome on their own, but also part of understanding the most important themes in A Song of Ice and Fire, and key to understanding what is up with green seer magic. The nature cycle. Only death can pay for life. First, both the children of the forest and green seer magic are surrounded by underworld symbolism. The children of the forest literally live under the world in caves, and the last green seer is a half-alive, half-dead, corpse-like dude who's gradually becoming a tree. As we examine the concept of the green, keep in mind the cyclical nature of life and death from the perspective of nature. A tree dies and another tree grows in its place. The more life present in nature, the more death will be present as well. It's balance the natural version of that whole only death can pay for life thing. I don't want to do a deep dive into mythology here, but take note that the gods or goddesses who symbolize both death and fertility are all over mythology. Hades, for example, in some tellings, stored grain underground during the fall or winter so that the seeds of new life could be planted in spring. In the traditional telling, Demeter, the goddess of agriculture and grain, causes the seasons to change because she neglects her duties during the winter months, when her daughter descends into the underworld. If you want to explore these mythologies in more depth, I recommend Sweet Sunray's essays on the Chthonic Cycle, and also the Nature Cycle Mythology panel from Kind of Thrones 2018, starring Crowfood's daughter, Ideas of Ice and Fire, and Lucifer Means Lightbringer. All of these panels and essays are linked in the show notes. The Passage to the Underworld, The Veil Between Worlds Also, consider that green seer magic relates to the broader idea of a gateway to the underworld. In A Song of Ice and Fire, the underworld is in part an actual place. I mean, Blood Raven, the half-dead, half-alive tree dude, hangs out in a cavern deep under the world. 
In this way, the underworld or the realm of the green seers is akin to an actual heaven or hell dimension apart from our reality. Sometimes, though, the underworld symbols are purely symbolic, but still allude to something magical or ineffable. For example, when Heil Hunt convinces Brienne to carry the heads of a men she killed through a forest in the Riverlands, Brienne thinks, quite reasonably, I might add, she did not want to travel through the green gloom of the piney woods with the heads of the men she'd killed. Brienne had no choice but to try and pretend they were not there, but sometimes, especially at night, she could feel their dead eyes on her back, and once she dreamed she heard them whispering to one another. The head is not, in fact, talking to her, but the scene reinforces the idea of dead people speaking through the whispers of the trees. Gateways to the underworld are compatible with the ancient religions and mythology George builds on throughout the text. Consider the role of the river Styx in Greek mythology. The underground cults that worshipped Isis and Mithras in the Middle East, and how cenotes are portals to the underworld in Mayan mythology. A central theme of all these mythologies, as well as a song of ice and fire, is that in certain locations, like underground caves or bodies of water, the veil between our world and the magical world is thin and permeable. The Green Arcana, a spectrum of weirwood magic. Second, it is a bit confusing to talk about green seer magic without defining what we are talking about, because green magic exists on a spectrum. I think a lot of disagreements in the fandom are actually arguments about what counts as green seer related magic, so I want to be crystal clear about the definition. As usual, the best clues we have come directly from characters explaining green seer magic in the text. As Jojen explains, It is given to few to drink of that green fountain while still in mortal flesh, to hear the whisperings of the leaves and see as the trees see, as the gods see. Most are not so blessed. The gods gave me only green dreams. So green magic encompasses not only Bran and Blood Ravens, time traveling, astral projection, green sight, but also Jojen's prophetic green dreams and the magic of skin changing. We also have strong evidence that powerful dreams can be inspired by proximity to weirwoods. Take, for example, the dream that Jamie has while sleeping in a weirwood grove. In Storm of Swords, Jamie dreams of watery caverns under Casterly Rock. Brienne, a pair of flaming blue swords. He is then inspired to go back to Harrenhal to save Brienne. This may be a kind of green dream where a green seer reached out from the weirwood net, maybe Blood Raven, into Jamie's head, or more likely, I think, it could be Jamie reacting to the weirwood on his own. It is not clear at all from the text. It is also heavily implied that green seer magic is a kind of blood magic. Weirwoods weep blood, weirwood seed paste is veined with blood, and maybe bits of Jojen. The first men made blood sacrifices to their heart trees, and the last time we heard from Bran in A Dance with Dragons, he was tasting blood as his life flowed out of him in a red tide. And speaking of weirwoods, there is also that talking weirwood door at the night fort, and if we plod through the mist of time, Westerosi legend holds that the children of the forest somehow raised the seas to break the arm of Dorne. This is a huge variety of different types of magic that go far beyond skin changing and seeing through the eyes of weirwoods. Although powerful green seer magic, the kind that allows you to skin change or control whatever you see through the weir net, is rare, it seems possible for non-green seers to tap into the magic of the green when the right artifacts or locations are present. Jojen and Jamie's dreams are both examples. And perhaps, even if you are not a green seer, 
you may be able to use the blood of a green seer to access enhanced magical abilities. Think of Melisandre and her obsession with king's blood, for example, or the Undying and their black tree-based psychedelic shade of the evening. To summarize, when I talk about green or green seer magic, I am using it as a fairly broad term that covers any magic that taps into the same source as the magic practiced by the children of the forest. This is powerful stuff. And aside from the idea that all magic has a price, George has left the limits of green seer magic to our imagination. But he has given us clues for where to find it. Green Prince to the Wet Wild. This next quote is perfect, so let's jump right in. What do the trees remember? The secrets of the old gods, said Jojen Reed. Truths the first men knew, now forgotten in Winterfell, but not in the wet wild. We live closer to the green in our bogs and crannogs, and we remember earth and water, soil and stone, oaks and elms and willows. They were here before us all, and will still remain when we are gone. Closer to the green, eh? Jojen is telling Bran pretty explicitly that in the wet wild, it is easier to remember the secrets of the old gods. What are the secrets of the old gods? The collective knowledge of the weirwood and the green seers. Green magic is stronger in places close to and connected with the life force of the earth. Not only trees, but earth and water, soil and stone. Recall what Melisandre has to say about the wall being a hinge of the world. George R. R. Martin has developed this idea of locations being key to strong magic elsewhere in the text. Grey Water Watch Naturally, the Reed's Home in the Neck Grey Water Watch is our first description of the wet wild. And it is a place that is as wet and green as it is hidden and hostile. Theon has this to say about the correct nomen of the neck in A Clash of Kings. You never see them, but they see you. Those who go into the bogs after them get lost and never come out. Their houses move. Even the castles, like Grey Water Watch. And we get these details from the World Book. The swamp dwellers of the Neck are known as Kragnomen for the floating islands on which they raise their halls and hovels amidst the fens and swamps and salt marshes. Ariane's Cave. And if all that was too subtle for you, George gives us a detailed, on point description of the wet wild in the Ariane 2 TWOW sample chapter. Spoilers, stop now if you don't want to read any of the TWOW pre-releases. Later, when Ariane arrives and explores a cave in the Rainwood, she will explicitly recognize the work of the children of the forest. Dust found them on the fringes of the Rainwood, a wet green world where brooks and rivers ran through dark forests and the ground was made of mud and rotting leaves. Huge willows grew along the watercourses, larger than Ariane had ever seen, their great trunks as gnarled and twisted as an old man's face, and festooned with beards of silvery moss. Trees pressed close on every side, shutting out the sun. Hemlock and red cedars, white oaks, soldier points that stood as tall and straight as towers, colossal sentinels, big leaf maples, redwoods, worm trees, and even here and there a wild weirwood. Underneath their tangled branches, ferns and flowers grew in profusion. Sword ferns, lady ferns, bellflowers, and piper's lace, evening stars and poison kisses, liverwort, lungwort, hornwort. Mushrooms sprouted down among the tree roots, and from their trunks as well, pale spotted hands that caught the rain. Other trees were furred with moss, green or gray or red-tailed, once a vivid purple. Lichens covered every rock and stone. Toadstools festered beside rotting logs. 
The very air seemed green. After further description, Arian continues, The wood was full of caves as well. That first night, they took shelter in one of them to get out of the wet. In Dorne, they had often traveled by dark, when the moonlight turned the blowing sands to silver. But the rainwood was too full of bogs, ravines, and sinkholes, and it was black as pitch beneath the trees, where the moon was just a memory. The woods are lovely, dark and deep walking the moist miles before we sleep. In Greywater Watch, and definitely in the Aryan sample chapter, George gives us a feast of green description, and it vividly develops the characteristics of the wet wild. We can take away a lot from these descriptions. On a direct and concrete level, Aryan's Cave and Greywater Watch show us the physical locations where green magic will be the strongest. Swampy, marshy, boggy places. But if they also operate on an abstract and symbolic level, they are hinting about how the magic itself works. Let's look at three key elements of the Wet Wild map. If you haven't already, this is a great time to let loose your giggles about how dirty this sounds or get over how much the word moist creeps you out. We're talking about cycle of life stuff here. So yeah, go to town on this sexy wet and wild double entendre. First, wet and green together. Wet and green are paired together. Science-wise, this makes sense. Water spawns green life. To borrow Jojen's words, the neck and the rainwood are green fountains. This ties into another more abstract metaphor and delightful pun that is present throughout the text. The pun on green sea, S-E-E, as in sight, and green sea, S-E-A, as in ocean. Honestly, I owe most of the depth of this analysis of the wet wild as a template for green magic to at Ravenous Reader on Twitter and also of the Westeros.org forums, who discovered the pun, and to Lucifer Means Lightbringer, who has used it to explore Patch Face's prophetic dreams, among other things, which of course all begin with Under the Sea. The Green Sea pun and symbolism are all over a song of ice and fire. You truly cannot unsee, unsee? them. Second, a dark green maze. The wet wild is a green maze, dark and overwhelming. The natural life in both the neck and the rainwood make it hard to find your way. People get lost trying to find gray water watch. In the rainwood, dark forests choke out the sun, and Arien cannot travel by night because it is black as pitch. The equation of green sight with darkness is extremely vivid throughout Bran's arc. In the cave beyond the wall, Blood Raven admonishes him. Never fear the darkness, Bran. The Lord's words were accompanied by a faint rustling of wood and leaf, a slight twisting of his head. The strongest trees are rooted in the dark places of the earth. Darkness will be your cloak, your shield, your mother's milk. Darkness will make you strong. Forests are dark. The night is dark and full of terrors. But in the underworld of the wet wild, caves reign supreme as places of dark magic. Caves, sinkholes, and crypts. Oh my. The wet wild is full of caves and sinkholes. Again, this jives with what we know about geology, because to grossly oversimplify, caves are formed by rock dissolving into water. A quick sidebar, caves, caverns, crypts, and mines are all over a song of ice and fire. So I am not arguing here that every place underground is somehow magical. But a lot of them definitely carry strong magical symbolism. The crypts of Winterfell, for example, are located underneath the godswood in a pool of still black water. There are creepy statues of the old dead Starks, 
and John and Bran return there over and over again in their dreams. That is a whole mess of not only dark symbolism, but also signs of green seer influence. Leaf calls out the hidden and hostile nature of the cave and ties together the symbols of darkness, mazes, and water, as he cautions. Men should not go wandering in this place. The river you hear is swift and black and flows down and down to a sunless sea. And there are passages that go even deeper, bottomless pits and sudden shafts, forgotten ways that lead to the very center of the earth. Any place with the three features we just talked about is not only likely to be full of green sea symbolism, but also likely close to where green sea magic is the strongest. Places closely tied to the natural cycle of life, death, and decay. They are green and black, dark and deep, wet and wild. We'll call that throughout A Song of Ice and Fire. George has closely tied magic to nature. These descriptions offer the careful reader clues while allowing the signs of magic to remain hidden in plain sight. A gray city in a green sea. If you are a couple steps ahead of me, you may be thinking, what in wild, I get it, but show me the trees! Bravos doesn't have any damn trees, or bloody weirwoods. Hold your sources, friends, we're getting there. But first, consider that the wet wild does not require trees. Our first example of green magic, the home of the reeds, is Greywater Watch, and it's bogs and salt marshes. And as we'll see, Bravos and the Neck share some strikingly green similarities. I'll also point out that gray water is distinctly evoking the more deathly side of the green equation. Another quick sidebar, some of these similarities may only be symbolic, meant to bring out the importance of green sight in Arya's arc. But bear with me, because I think that there are enough clues to reinforce the conclusion that dark green magic is at the heart of the mysteries of Bravos, A drear, green, uninviting place. Let's start with the world book's description of where these escaped slave Moonsinger founding followers of Bravos chose to settle. The lagoon where the fugitives found a refuge seemed a drear and uninviting place. Of mud flats, tidal shallows, and salt marshes at first glance, but it was well hidden beyond outlying islands and sea stacks and oft cloaked from above by fog. Moreover, its brackish waters were rich with fish and shellfish of all sorts. The sheltering islands were thickly forested. A well-hidden lagoon of mudflats and marshes nestled behind thickly forested islands and cloaked by fog? You don't say, that sure sounds a lot like Greywater Watch, but in the sea. Check out this image. That is apparently what someone on Reddit thinks Greywater Watch looks like. I'd have to imagine that this is a heck of a lot what the city of Bravos would look like were it less developed and, you know, if it had some trees. Jojen tells Bran back in A Game of Thrones, Ravens can't find Greywater Watch, no more than our enemies. The Bravosi version is just, no one can find Bravos. Pun intended. A bridge over green water. In Bravos, wet and green are paired together. Upon arriving in Bravos, Arya vividly observes that the candles and marshes surrounding the islands are green thinking to herself that Bravos is a gray city in a green sea. To make sure we get the imagery right, Arya also sees a broad expanse of pea green water rippled like a sheet of colored glass, a great canal, a broad green waterway that ran straight into the heart of the city. But all this is just a coincidence, right? George is just giving us these descriptions because that's what marshes and canals look like. But then you discover this passage from Arya's initial voyage through the canals of Bravos. 
acting like a green sea, green seer Dakota ring, literally bridging the gap between the natural sea and the magical sea. They passed under the arches of a carved stone bridge, decorated with half a hundred kinds of fish and crabs and squids. A second bridge appeared ahead, this one carved in lacy, leafy vines, and beyond that, a third, gazing down on them from a thousand painted eyes. The bridge is so vivid that it almost speaks for itself. The wet and wild under the green sea represented by fish and crabs and squids. The wet wild above the green sea represented by leafy vines. And a thousand painted eyes, just like Bran's refrain in Blood Raven's cave, gazing down on them. A cloak of fog, a maze of canals. Bravos is cloaked by fog and built on top of a system of maze-like underground caverns. I'm going to save my discussion of the underground caverns for our next part, because there's some additional context we need before we can plumb those depths. Moreover, the maze-like caverns are closely tied to the House of Black and White itself. Bravos is also replete with hostile imagery about getting lost in canals and drowning in green canal water. This is a great example of how George mixes abstract symbolic clues like getting lost with more specific nature-driven in imagery. Blundering Nights and Lost Gilly Flowers Let's use this delightful exchange between Bran and Jojen to explore the idea of getting lost in or drowning in the green. Not one of them could find it. They ride into the neck but not back out and sooner or later they blunder into the bogs and sink beneath the weight of all that armor and drown. The thought of drowned knights under the water gave Bran the shivers. There are a million things I love about this passage. The similar imagery to the dead marshes from The Lord of the Rings, the Arthurian nod to islands getting lost in the mists, and of course the symbolism of people drowning in the green. George uses Sam's POV to help establish the hostility of Bravos to outsiders. Sam recounts that the stony maze of islands and canals that was Bravos frightened Gilly so badly that she soon lost the map and herself. Master Aemon, on the verge of death and troubled by dreams of dragons and the princess that was promised, has the following exchange with Sam. I have dreamt enough for now. Canal water will suffice. Help me if you would. Sam eased the old man up and held the cup to his dry, cracked lips. Even so, half the water dribbled down the maester's chest. <coughs> Enough, Eamon coughed after a few sips. You'll drown me. He shivered in Sam's arms. Why is the room so cold? If you remember that we learned in Arya's first Bravos POV that the canal water is green, you will get a lovely abstract image of a Targaryen drowning under the cold green sea. Cat of the Canals and the Claws of Death It gets more literal quickly when Sam crosses paths with Arya, who is posing as Cat of the Canals. When Cat defends Sam from a troublesome Bravo, the Bravo tries to threaten her, saying, Little cats who howl too howled get fucking shit. <sighs> Cat of the Canals and the Claws of Death. It gets more literal quickly when Sam crosses paths with Arya, who is posing as Cat of the Canals. When Cat defends Sam from a troublesome Bravo, the Bravo tries to threaten her, saying, Little cats who howl too loud get drowned in the canals. And Cat retorts, not if they have claws. And of course, Arya Stark has claws. Memorably, in the Cat of the Canals chapter later in Feast, Arya slits the throat of Daron, a Night's Watch deserter, and pushes him into the canal. I could probably write an entire essay unpacking the symbolism of those events by themselves, but let's quickly note the obvious. 
George is tying drowning and the green sea to death. Arya, who can skin change direwolves and cats, has the green in her blood, and she moves through the canals of Bravos like a natural born killer, delivering northern justice and drowning a Night's Watch to serve her. Arya is ruling the green sea and delivering death. She is acting as nature's instrument of death during her time in Bravos. In the fog, all men are killers. Finally, let's take a brief look at how the fog in Bravo serves to enhance the wet wild imagery and allude to the presence of green magic. After all, the kindly man has said that this is the city that helped the faceless men flower among the northern fogs. She could tell the fog was thick from the clammy way her clothes clung to her and the damp feeling of the air on her bare hands. The mists of Bravos did queer things to sounds as well, she found. Half the city will be half blind tonight. The mists seemed to part before her and close up again as she passed. The cobblestones were wet and slick under her feet. She heard a cat yowl plaintively. Bravos was a good city for cats. They roamed everywhere, especially at night. In the fog, all cats are gray, Mercy thought. In the fog, all men are killers. This is chilly, ghostly imagery for sure. The fog makes sure everyone is a ghost and a killer. And Arya feels like she can control the mists that part before her as she prowls the night. Spelunking for magic, a conclusion and teaser. After comparing passages from Bravos to passages from other locations where green magic is present, it is hard to deny that Bravos checks many of the same boxes as Greywater Watch and the Rainwood, where Arain finds the cave of the Children of the Forest. Even looking primarily above ground, it's easy to create a long list of comparisons, running from how damp and disorienting these places are to how hostile they are to outside life they drown out, and how once you're trapped there, the gray or green water seems all-consuming, almost as if the place itself were watching you. These similarities and symbols are intentional. George is using vivid sensory imagery to show how these green locations are alive with magic. But where is this magic? Remember the abandoned iron mine beneath the house of black and white? What if it wasn't a mine at all, but instead some kind of magic cave? Like for example, Blood Raven's cave or Ariane's cave that we looked at briefly as part of the wet wild green print. Indeed, caves have their own set of concrete characteristics that are tied to the presence of the children of the forest. I could devote an entire essay to sussing out these characteristics. And in fact, someone already has. So if you are looking for a more detailed description of the similarities between caves, caverns, and hollow hill magic in the Seven Kingdoms, I commend to your reading this excellent essay by Wiz the Smith that is linked in the show notes. In the next part of this series, we will examine not only caves and hollow hills, but all the different magic artifacts present in the House of Black and White, beneath the green sea of Bravos. <laughs>